Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this month. My name is Megan Strout, and I am the co-founder and CEO of TAC Advisors. I'm so excited to dig into this topic with you today about storytelling and how your unique background really can create value for you personally and professionally. I'm especially excited about this topic because next week is Administrative Professionals Day, although I'd argue every day is Administrative Professionals Day at TAC Advisors. Um, and, you know, I just think it's a super important topic because administrative professionals are typically behind the scenes and don't have the opportunity to really talk about themselves or put themselves, you know, in the limelight. And so we're going to kind of walk through today how you can do that in a really comfortable and authentic way. So um, before I introduce our co-host and guest on this topic, Katie, we created a quick little poll for everybody. Um, we wanted to just sort of get a, an understanding of where everybody is on their comfort level of telling their story. So I just went ahead and launched it. And if those of you who are joining us could fill it out, that would be super helpful. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Can you share with our community a little bit about yourself and your company Lived and Loved? Absolutely. And I'll get a chance to share several stories as we go through, but I am honestly so excited to be here and talk about career stories today. Two years ago, when I left my corporate job, I took a break and I did a lot of work that helped me figure out what my next steps would be. Mm -hmm. And during that time, one of the most powerful learnings of the whole journey was that knowing my story and sharing it was a big part of both my growth mm -hmm. and it was my purpose. Mm -hmm. So I found it lived and loved to help other people find their stories. And we have this unique way of doing that. So now I get to spend my time working with people to harness the power of their stories and have conversations like this one. Amazing. Well, um, I think it's a you know timely topic. If you look at our poll, about 67% of the people joining us today are like kind of comfortable telling their story, but feel like it could definitely be honed. And another 22% of the people joining us are not at all comfortable about talking about themselves. <laughs> so I think it's very timely that we're having this. Um, and why don't we go ahead? I'll share those results for everybody joining us. Um, so, you know, I've been there too, right? Like, I don't think I actually felt comfortable talking about myself or sharing my story until I got in my last role as a recruiter because I would have to prep people for interviews. And that question of tell me about yourself came up a lot. And so for me being be able to coach other people on that, I really had to hone that story and give them an example of how I navigate like my, my career I, you know, explanation because mine's taken a lot of twists and turns. And so I needed to figure out like, what were those common threads so that my story made sense? I think that's especially hard for people in our industry that are more generalist in nature, where maybe you've done a bunch of different things and it can be really tough to kind of cut through and say, here is this, you know, memorable, compelling thing that makes sense out of this very large picture story I have. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we um, kind of start off with a, like an example of what not to do? Um, because again, like, uh, I'll be honest, I whenever I prep somebody for an interview, the first question I go through is tell me about yourself because it is so incredibly vague, right? It can go in a lot of different directions. And most people spend 20 minutes answering that question. <laughs> so why don't we talk about like, or give an example of like what is not so great or what not to do. Happy to jump in here because I am, uh, I definitely had plenty of opportunities to do this wrong in my career. So this is what I used to say when people would ask me about my background or say some version of, tell me about yourself, which happens a lot in professional life, whether you're looking for jobs or meeting people, happens all the time. Yeah. So this is what I would do, I would say. Well, I'm Katie. I'm originally from Minnesota. I was born and raised there. Went to college at the University of Minnesota. After college, I left the state, went to California for warmer weather, worked as a consultant for a few years. Then I decided to go back to business school. So I went to business school. And after that, I started my career in banking and I held a number of roles in banking. I started in credit underwriting 
Then I moved into marketing strategy. Eventually I was a chief of staff and then I led an ops team and on and on and on. <laughs> and it would be this, this story of, of my Literally career. walking through your resume. Yeah. Basically, yes. And I would kind of frame it as I did a little bit of everything. Let me tell you about a little bit of everything that I did. Yeah. And then did you ever catch, because I know when I used to do my sort of similar story that people would start to like fall asleep or like their eyes would glaze over. Like, oh, as you uh, gave them. Uh, I did. I am so guilty of it. <laughs> and I would get bored telling it because it's not yeah. an exciting story. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, I it's you held so many roles and you've been working for what 10, 15, 20 years now, especially somebody who's like later on in their career. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm I think this year is my 17th or 18th year working. And so I've held a lot of roles and that that story can get very, very long. So like yes, we need to <laughs> we need to land the plane and and really reel it in. And so why don't we sort of walk through like where things went wrong and why this was a forgettable story. Yes, let's dissect it. <laughs> so um, kind of to what we just spoke about, there was just too much detail, right? Like at the end of the day, your your story, the answer to tell me about yourself or really like your brand, whether it's the summary on your LinkedIn profile or, you know, any of the the kind of collateral, like it cannot, like people, people don't have time to read or listen to something that's like 15 minutes, like even five minutes is too long. Like this needs to be a minute and a half, short and sweet, um, you know, get, to, get to the point. I think the second piece is that it's like kind of generic, right? Like I worked in banking, I worked as a credit, then I worked as a chief of staff. Like, you know, there's a lot of people who've worked in banking and probably a decent amount of people who've held chief of staff roles. So what makes you really interesting and unique as a chief of staff in your role, right? And then there's just not really like an emotional hook, you know, like what is drawing people to you? Like what makes you, Katie McBrien, special and interesting and compelling to make people want to hear more behind that minute and a half pitch? Um, and again, what's the theme? Because again, you kind of pivoted and you went to a few different industries and you've held a bunch of different roles. So what is that common thread that ties that all together? I think I was guilty of each one of these, as you very clearly pointed out, Megan. <laughs> so <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah. So so I'm curious to now, like how how do you answer this question that make sure you don't do these things um, that is compelling and makes people want to come back for more. Yeah. So let's do a better example. So if you were to ask me this question today, you'd get a version that sounds more like this. So after a long career in banking, where I did a little bit of everything, but mostly focused on people and culture, I took a sabbatical. And on this break, I thought really long and hard about what I wanted to do in my next chapter. And I kept coming back to this experience I had seven years ago. It was after my sister had passed. Um, she died unexpectedly. And in the aftermath, we were doing all the things that you have to do when someone passes, the funeral prep, the obituary, and kind of getting her life story together. And what I realized is I didn't actually know her story. I knew bits and pieces of her as an adult, but I didn't have that comprehensive view. So I decided that I would explore this idea of helping people tell their stories while they're here. And it started out with this concept of write people's obituaries with them while they're living so that their families will have this artifact of them after they pass. And I went out and talked to people about this and not surprisingly, no one wanted to talk to me about obituaries, <laughs> um, but I did hold on to that concept of story. Mm -hmm. And I realized that story could be so much more so it evolved into this concept of helping people find their stories and use them in different ways, not just for um, a memorial, but they can be for personal development. It can be to celebrate your life and feel gratitude. It can be about growing as a professional. There are so many different facets of story. So all of this turned into Lived and Loved, which is the company that I run today. And I ask people simple questions, things that are easy to engage with. 
and then help them see those connections and kind of draw that narrative out for whatever purpose that they need the story. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a writer and a chief of staff. And you might say, hey, those things are unrelated. But the theme that I draw around them is all three require the same mindset. And it's the mindset of looking at a big picture and finding connections and finding similarities and making sense of things in a new way. Um, not surprisingly, my top strength is connectedness. So mm -hmm. the ability to kind of see those connections. Yeah. And I use that in all three of these different things that I do. I bring that talent to um, each of the things that I pursue. I love that. I think that's really great. And it definitely pulls at your heartstrings. Like, you know, regardless of, you know, you had unfortunately like a tragic incident in your personal life and it, you don't necessarily always need to do that. But I love the part of even pulling in like your strength of connectedness and, you know, bringing things and boiling all together, all three of these sort of roles that you've had of being a storyteller and a chief of staff. And I just think that that's a really good summary. And, and it was, it was interesting. I did not see you glazing over during that one, yeah. Megan. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we turn the mic over to you? I'd love to hear a, a memorable version of your story. Yeah. Um, and I get asked this a lot, <laughs> all the time. Um, so, so really my professional story kind of came through my first job I got in high school, sort of out of desperation. Um, I was pretty horribly bullied in high school and, you know, didn't have any activities or outlets outside of like school activities to have like make new friends or just have a purpose. And I applied for this job at the Breakers, which is a luxury hotel on Palm Beach Island. My sister had been working at it. She was so happy every single day. And I'm like, I just want to go somewhere where I feel safe and happy. And they took a chance on me and gave me a job as a service assistant, which is kind of hilarious because I'm incredibly clumsy. And I was like, I definitely spilled water on somebody once. Um, and that job like totally changed my life and my career trajectory. I just fell in love with serving other people and spent the next 10 years of my career sort of moving through the ranks of hotel management and held roles like as a front desk agent, as a front office manager, as a sales assistant. And the, the common sort of thread through all of those roles is that I came into a role not knowing how to do any of it, learned it from the ground up, mastered it, and then trained and developed people under me. And so at 26, when I made a career pivot into recruiting, which again was something I had no experience ever doing before, I did the same thing. I came into the role really curious. I learned it from the ground up. I mastered it and then trained and developed a team under me. So in 2019, when my now co-founder, um, who is formerly a candidate of mine, um, came to me with this idea to start Tech Advisors, he had been for the past few years training and coaching EAs and chiefs of staff as sort of a side hustle. And he had seen a gap in the marketplace that there were tons of recruiting firms. There were individuals and coaches doing training and development, but there was no business that brought all of that under one place. And so, you know, I think having seen what my kind of career trajectory looked like and the fact that, you know, I love to build and I love to bring people together and I love to help people and train and develop others, like this new company and this concept just made a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much for sharing that. What strikes me about this is at the end, I think, wow, I really get Megan. You know, you brought in something from very early in your life that's been this common thread through all of your career. And it just makes so much sense. And you can see how you're clearly just so passionate about it. Yeah. I mean, I love it. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who can say that like every day you go to work feeling really fulfilled. And, um, and it's, you know, now I'm in this job and I have this company that I really feel like fulfills everything in my career, my life that I've loved to do. That's just amazing. Yeah. So why don't we then kind of walk through like what made your story and my story perhaps a little bit more interesting or more memorable. <laughs> so each of our stories were really unique and personal, right? Like, although, you know, some people may have had similar life experiences 
um, it's still like a very unique story to each one of us. And I think both of us probably stayed under a minute and a half ish, right? So it was quick. It was to the point. It, you know, people didn't have the opportunity to really meander a little bit. Um, I mean, I was connected to your story. Like I, like it pulled at my heartstrings, right? Like it was interesting. Um, it made me. It felt authentic, right? And it made me like want to talk to you more. Um, and I think it it shared a, a a theme and a direction, right? Like in your case, like storytelling, you know, large concepts and disseminating it into small facts. You know, I think for mine, it's this common thread of customer service and helping others and training and developing people sort of is consistent throughout it. And so I think that's what really sort of makes these good stories. A hundred percent agree. One thing I'll add to this is sometimes when you're telling stories, especially in a professional context, there's this fear of getting personal or of sharing something that feels a little bit hard to talk about or vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And then when one person does it, it kind of gives the other people permission to go there too. There's this going first dynamic that happens. So I think as storytellers or as people sharing our stories, if we're willing to go there and do some of that, you get these incredible benefits, but it can be hard to get to that point. So Megan, how did you get to where you are today, where you have this story and you're confident telling it and you can bring in things that are probably not the most fun to talk about, but are important to your story? Yeah. And I, I, so I'll, I'll kind of explain you how I got here, but I'll I'll also say that, you know, now seven, eight years into doing this, um, at least kind of sharing that story or my story, it's still not a hundred percent comfortable. So like, it's always a work in progress. I spoke at this conference a month ago where I went into a lot more detail than what I just shared um, for an exercise we were doing. And I was definitely really nervous about it because I'm like, you know, I've, I've, I've been through a lot of adversity in my life and is this too personal or, you know, how are people going to react to this? And I, I received such an overwhelming positive response after the fact of people being like, I went through the same thing as you. I was also bullied as a kid. I also had people who like treated me not well, or, you know, managers who didn't believe in me or all these things. And so I think obviously keep it pretty professional, like and still in context, but you just don't know like what you're going to connect with somebody on. Like even I remember I had, you know, hired and interviewed somebody um, a couple of years ago who, uh, you know, was honest in her interview. She's like, I was in, well, she was like a D1 athlete and she goes, but it was hard. Like what, you know, kept me going every day is like, you know, cause the, the people on the team were bullying me and like I was constantly getting like pushed and she goes but I just kept showing up every single day because I, I love playing this sport and like this is what I wanted to do and in my head I'm like great because this job and recruiting is really tough and every single day people are going to say no and sometimes you're going to get screamed out on the phone and <laughs> like so if you can push through and show that you can come beyond that adversity like in your previous life, right? The best indicator of future success is past performance. You probably are gritty enough to do this job. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of gonna lead into a little bit what we're talking about later. Like you just don't know what your unique life experience is, how they're gonna connect to your current role or a future role and how that's going to speak to somebody else. Because that's like, what I heard from her is you're gritty, you know, what she, like, I don't know if that's intentionally what she was going after when she shared that interview answer with me. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. It's, it's making me think of, uh, so when my sister passed, I hadn't told anyone at work that she was sick leading up to it. It was this thing that I just felt like I needed to carry myself. And after she passed, of course, I told people what had been going on and shared a bit more. And the people who came up to me, I thought I was being so 
vulnerable, not professional, you know, I was crying at work a lot. It was, it was a messy situation, but the people who came up to me and said things like, it's so special to see a leader who's willing to just live the practice of bringing your whole self to work. It makes it okay for me to talk about some of these things that are hard. So where I was judging myself and my story for a set of things and saying, here's a deficiency. Yeah. Other people were seeing it as this benefit and, you know, something to look up to. So it yeah. really helps to have that other perspective of the things that we're experiencing firsthand. Yeah. And I think it probably you and I, we've been working now for 15, 20 years. Like it wasn't that way 15, 20 years ago when we, when we worked, I think we're at a newer era um, in the workplace where be, bringing your whole self to work and, you know, having a little bit more like flexibility or like openness to like sometimes have a bad day. Definitely you know, just makes you a more approachable like human being, right? An approachable colleague, an approachable boss, you know? So I, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, in, in more cases nowadays, it is better received. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you did some work on your story over the years. I'd love to hear about your process. Yeah. So I did this exercise uh, in April of 2019 at my last company. And this was really where I think the light bulb went off. So I'd been doing the tell me about yourself, like coaching, and I had it like pretty well honed. But I think the piece that like I was really missing was the emotional connection part of my answer. And so this activity we did as a company um, required you to basically answer eight questions um, or eight, you had to write down eight of your life accomplishments. And it, it didn't necessarily have to be work-based. It could be personal, like it didn't matter the timeline. It could be stuff from like early childhood, adulthood, you know, school, whatever. And you, so you fill those out. Everybody in the, the company fills them out. And we had a small team. There were like 10, 15 people in the company. So we could do it as a whole company. And um, and then what you do is you repeat back to everybody publicly, like what you thought these accomplishments were in your life. And they're, they're what's personal to you, not necessarily what other people would find as accomplishments. It's not like getting a 4.0 GPA. Like it could be, maybe that is really connected to you, but maybe like, it's not about the grades. It was the fact that like, you just survived getting through high school, right? Like it could be, <laughs> it could be anything. And so I went through my accomplishments and what I expected to hear people say, because after you go through those accomplishments, um, you have your teammates repeat back what they heard were the common themes, which was really helpful. And I expected them to say, oh, you've overcome a lot of adversity. Like you have a lot of grit. You don't take no for an answer. Like, because in that in my head, that's what my story was. What they actually heard was you love to build, which I had never heard that before. I was like, oh, like, all right, cool. Um, you're good at working in ambiguous environments. You um, have this unique balance of operations and sales experience. You um, aren't afraid to reinvent yourself and you love it to train and develop others. And so, and then of course I wrote all that down and then like looked at it on paper and I'm like, this, like, this is amazing. Like I'd never thought of myself that way before. And it really took hearing from my peers what they saw as the common three themes to like really bring in that like emotional hook for me. And what is really interesting that I don't think I've ever actually technically shared the timeline before publicly, but exactly seven days after I did that exercise, I had to look back on my calendar. Um, Al Hussein, who's my now co-founder, had reached out to me and met up with me for cocktails at the time we were just friends. And like I said, he had formerly been a candidate of mine. And he pitched me this idea of starting tech advisors. And I'm like 100% positive that had I not done that exercise seven days ago, I wouldn't have had the self-confidence or even the like mentality in my head that like, 
I could build this, Mm -hmm. that I could jump into working in like truly an ambiguous environment. I mean, this is a a company and a concept that had never been done before. Um, And that like, I, I was even probably worthy of doing this and training others and, and like building this company. Like, I don't think I would have had that that worthiness or that self-confidence. And so like, I, I'm like also kind of into like manifesting, like what you want. And so I think like doing that exercise in a way sort of manifested making this company happen. I have chills just hearing (laughs) about that. I, it makes me think of that saying when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Oh, I've never heard that thing before. The teacher was this amazing opportunity. Yeah. You were ready to take it on because of what you've just gone through. That's so incredible. I've definitely learned a lot. (laughs) (laughs) More than I would have ever expected. (laughs) So, so what about you? I mean, how did you, did you have this sort of like aha moment or did it just sort of organically happen? So I'll share a couple of stories because I feel like my path has been kind of like a roller coaster that goes up and then comes down a little bit and then spikes again. So I've had two big waves of developing my story. Mm -hmm. The first was very similar to what you described. It happened at, um, I was at a leadership program at Georgetown Mm -hmm. and it was this wonderful group of 15 or so people that I got to interact with over the course of I think it was six or eight months. So we would see each other once a month for a while. And during that time, we did a lot of exercises. It's like boot camp for learning about yourself, which is great. Uh, but one of them that really sticks in my mind was called My Story in Five Faces. Mm-hmm. And for this, you had to go and find five pictures of yourself from five different points of your life. And then you looked at the pictures and you wrote the story of the woman from that time. So who was she? What did she care about? What was she doing? Basically five moments in in your life. And then you kind of looked at what was the trend? What were the themes? And I think by adopting all these different personas that were me, but at different times throughout my life, helped me to see some of the things I didn't along with I had to share it with my colleagues, of course, because every time you do this, you have to share it with people, then they reflect it back to you. But that process of kind of the inside out, outside in, helped me identify some good patterns and some not so good patterns (laughs) that I had had, one of which was around burnout, which continued to play itself out where I would push myself really hard and then kind of reach a breaking point. Yeah. So I did reach one of those breaking points because I apparently did not break that pattern after learning about it. Um, I went on sabbatical uh, a couple of years ago, and this time I, I describe it as I tried everything to find my story and to find my next step because I was in this very uncomfortable, I knew the old answer wasn't the right answer, but I didn't have a new answer yet. So I was sitting there in the unknown, which for people who are doers and like to be moving forward is super uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that some of the things I did I did a lot of reflection. I did a lot of journaling. I wrote probably two books worth of material. I went into nature by myself. I went to the desert. I hiked. I did all these things. And the story that I learned at the end of this, or what I realized about myself was, you're not a one thing person. This was where I realized I was a generalist because I just couldn't narrow it down. I had a list of about a hundred businesses that I thought about and might have you know, considered starting. And I kept trying to get down to this one moment and I expected this light shining through the clouds thing would happen on the top of a mountain and I would have the light bulb and be like, this is it. But instead the answer was, you're going to do a few things and that's fine. (laughs) So now I've embraced that story and I use it as part of my, um, part of my strategy is just, it's okay to do a few things and it's okay to be a generalist and talk about it. So now that that's the the second peak of the roller coaster. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to share one other moment from this cohort program that was really sticks in my head. Yeah. Uh, of the benefit of having other people who can help you see things. Yeah. So I was in 
class one day and I was talking to my partner about this piece of feedback I had gotten. It must have been at the end, end of your cycle or sometime when I was getting feedback. Mm -hmm. And it was something to the effect of you aren't passionate and forceful enough in meetings. Like you aren't getting your point across in that way. Like think very male banker style. You're not that. Yeah. So I took this to heart and I said, okay, I am somehow deficient. And I was talking to my partner about this and he listened patiently. And then he stopped me and he said, Katie, you are never going to be the loudest person in the room. You are never going to talk the most, but when you do talk, because you're so thoughtful, you have really important things to say. Yeah. People stop and listen. Mm -hmm. And that totally took me aback. And I had to sit with it for a minute. And it was like this switch flipped in my head where I saw the way that I was was not deficient. In fact, it was a strength that I could use going forward. But I just had to see it through this other perspective and say, oh, well, here's the flip side. And here's the good part about the way that I am. Yeah. I had this major mental block mindset thing that I had to work through where I saw my story and the way that I was, wasn't special. I think probably because I'm living it and I was looking at other people who are different and feeling like maybe it wasn't enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that sort of just like had a little trigger from my <laughs> previous life in hospitality. Um, that, I, I, and this is probably a conversation for like another day. We should do a whole nother webinar on this um, of like, did, did you feel when you got that feedback and then had that aha moment from your partner, you were like, I'm not deficient. I'm just not a fit. Like I'm, I'm not in the right place where people appreciate my skills. It took a while to get there. Mm -hmm. I think now I see that very clearly where I can say you have a bunch of amazing skills. Some of them were a fit for that environment. Some of them weren't. But at the time I was so embedded in the yeah. the corporation and kind of the culture that you drank the Kool-Aid and you yeah. were just like devastated. I was the same way. I was <laughs> like, I was so heartbroken when I got somewhat similar feedback, but I'm the opposite. I'm like very loud, <laughs> like very forceful. Um, and like, I came from like a very conservative industry where they were like, you should be seen and not heard. And, um, and that didn't, didn't quite didn't quite work. And so when I was talking to one of my um, mentors about this, who had worked with me at the company, um, he was like, no, you're awesome. You, like this job is just not a fit for you. Like, and then, you know, come to, then I moved to San Francisco and people like love it and embrace it. And like, they're like, no, we want to hear what you have to say. And like, but it's just like, sometimes it's just not a fit too. And so you can have those kind of aha moments, which I think is really interesting, but totally off topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but it, but you but that also kind of goes back to topic of like that piece of like imposter syndrome and like how are you showing up? Like, are you showing up confidently? Or are you showing up in a way where like you feel like your story isn't interesting or unique or like you aren't aligned? So tell me a little bit more about kind of your thoughts around like your story and feeling confident and like seeing the threads and like making sure that you're like in the place where you're supposed to be that's in alignment. So this is another spot where I had to do a lot of uh, internal work to get to where I am today. Yeah. So I used to view the world of business leader storytelling in a certain way. And tell me if this happened to you too. <laughs> do you see these stories about the CEO who wakes up at 4.30 in the morning and takes an ice bath and then runs for two hours and meditates and then like works for 12 hours, like does more things than there are hours a day. Yeah. Or, you know, such and such company got funded for millions of dollars or you see like, oh, I had this near-death experience and that caused me to start this company and, you know, those types of stories. Mm -hmm. And they're great stories. And that's why we pay attention and we remember them. Yeah. But I would call them part of the extreme business genre of storytelling, if we yeah. think of it in genres. Mm -hmm. 
So then when I was reflecting on my own story, it doesn't fit that mold at all. And I thought, you know, this isn't what you see in the news. It's not what you see in, you know, Entrepreneur Magazine. Maybe it's not worth telling. Maybe I shouldn't be out there talking about it. Yeah. Until I realized, you know, there are so many genres out there in the world. And some stories are more reflective and contemplative in nature, like a documentary or a memoir. And there are plenty of audiences for those things, right? I am one of them. I know, you know, not everybody's going to see action and adventure movies all the time. They're great, but there are plenty of other movies to see. Yeah. So I had to kind of change my mindset about, it's not always about these extremes. It's not, Mm -hmm. you know, the person who went to live in Antarctica for a year. Sometimes it can be the person who lives a fairly normal life and they just share part of themselves with the rest of the world. So I've gotten over that somewhat. I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say I'm all the way there. This is probably one of those work in progress types of thing, but I see a lot of value in bringing my own vulnerability into it Mm -hmm. and talking about things people can relate to just like you shared with your example. Mm -hmm. People have experienced the things I talk about, whether it's you lose someone you love, you feel like you're stuck, you Mm -hmm. don't see the path in front of you. Like these are very common human experiences and you don't have to have the most extreme version of it for it to be worthwhile for you to talk about it and say something to the world. So when I do share stories, I hear from people, like like we both mentioned, it feels like I'm less alone, people relate to it, and they just appreciate having someone who's willing to talk about it. So I see the same pattern when I'm working with people on their stories, where they don't see themselves fitting into that mold of the biggest, the brightest, the, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever word you want to put into it, the eye-catching news of the day. Yeah. So then they decide to say nothing. And what I tell them is, I, of course, share a story like what I just shared with you. Um, But I try to get them to see that being authentic and sharing parts of themselves, even if it's these smaller moments, even if it just reaches one person, Mm -hmm. it's truly worth it. And that kind of helps you get over the feeling of like, not everybody needs to be dazzled by your story, but if you touch one person, that's good. Yeah. Well, and just the the exercise of sharing your story and getting constant feedback like I said like you know like I get more and more confident every single time I share a story like my story or version of it whether it's you know on a webinar or like in person at a conference or you know and then people react and I you know I take all of that like I love after a webinar I get an email and be like this webinar like really hit home for me thank you so much like it made a difference right like I like love those emails I love the LinkedIn messages, like, and you just don't know, like, what's going to hit, and I also think, like, like you said, there's these, like, eye-catching news stories, and this, you know, entrepreneur that, you know, like you said, working 12 hours a day, I fast, like, I'm never going to be that person. (laughs) I am, like, hashtag real normal chick, like, I, like, (laughs) just washed my hair for the first time in four days this morning for this webinar, like, I like struggle to get a workout in on a daily basis, like up until like two years ago before I had my EA, I was for sure, you know, working 12 to 14 hour days and then like in burnout mode, like, and people mm-hmm. just want to know that you're like a normal, real person. Um, and, and I think that like people are like grasping for that. Like people want to know that they're not alone. And so yeah. sometimes like just being a super real person is, is really great. A hundred percent agree. <laughs> um, all right. So we, t- we talked about like what makes a really great story. Why don't we put, talk about like how we use them and like why it's important for no matter what your job is, whether you have a job, whether you don't have a job, whether, you know, like why is knowing what your brand is and then reflecting that sort of across the board and having that consistency important. So like, I'll tell, like, I'll be honest, I probably get asked this question 
at least a half a dozen times a week, either between like speaking to pros- like prospective clients, um, talking to existing candidates, talking mm-hmm. to potential like partners, um, going on dates, like, <laughs> like I'm going like, tell me about yourself. How do you start your company? <laughs> like, like, and you well, don't want to sound like a robot, practice, right? <laughs> right. Like, I mean, it's giving me practice, but like, I, like I answer this question a lot. Um, and so the reason why it's important besides, you know, not wanting to put people to sleep when they're talking to me every single day, um, is that, you know, I want my brand and what people think about me, like when, when I leave the room, right, to be consistent and I want to be authentic and be a, like a hashtag real person and, um, you know, being consistent across what I say and what I do is really, really important. And it's, you know, it's how I win business. It's how I grow business. It's how I provide a livelihood for myself. It's how I provide a livelihood for my employees. And so like, I'm hyper, hyper sensitive around every, like my presence personally and how I interact with people and what I put on social media being consistent across that. So, um, and why this is important I think in an administrative capacity, so like take me out of the equation, if like you're an administrative professional on this webinar and why it's important is that if you're currently employed, you're a reflection of your executive and your company. Like I like I remember when I first first started at the Breakers in orientation, and it's written in the employee handbook that um what you say and do outside of work is a reflection of what you do when you're at work. And if they catch wind of you like getting drunk on a table and being like, I work at the breakers, you know, like that is like, like that's like, you can get fired for that, right? Like I would never do that, but like they essentially like Mm -hmm. lay it out of, you are more than just what you do in the workplace. And that message needs to be consistent throughout. And it's the same thing even if you're in a role that isn't as like forward facing as a CEO or a marketing manager or whatever, like as an executive assistant or chief of staff or office manager, like you are truly the face of your executive and the company. And so like, you better believe that companies are Googling you, that your executive's colleague is Googling you. They're looking you up. If you aren't employed and you're actively looking for a job and you're applying, recruiters are Googling you. Mm -hmm. You know, execs are scouring the internet, looking for how you express yourself on social media. I have had over the past eight years of me doing this, timeless amounts of clients who are like, I will not interview this person because I don't like the way they show themselves up like on Twitter or, you know, like we are a very like neutral work environment. Like we, they need to either put it private or we, they can't work with us. And so like, and the reason why that's important, like, cause some people might be like, well, that's really crappy, but you have to put it into the perspective of when you're especially, well, it it really doesn't really matter what level you are, an office manager or office coordinator, a C-level executive assistant, a personal assistant, chief of staff, like you're really given the keys to the kingdom. Like you are entrusted with a tremendous amount of important and confidential information about your exec, about your company, financials, personal life events, like, and they're making a judgment call based on your social media and how you promote yourself online on whether or not you can be discreet. Mm -hmm. Like, are you reflecting a way of having emotional intelligence in the ability to be discreet? Because if like, you can't do that yourself, how can I trust you to do that for me? And so I just think it's like so important. It's something that like, even from, you know, at age 16 in the breakers, and they said that I've like kept that consistent all the way throughout my career. Um, I'm going to get off that soapbox now. So Katie, (laughs) tell me about like how you use your story as a reflection of your brand. I mean, it kind of, I mean, your company is all about this. So 
So you're giving me flashbacks to my corporate days Mm -hmm. when I was in full on corporate mode. And I basically hesitated to say anything online outside of the, you know, here's my job update. I took a new role, which happened a lot um, Mm -hmm. or company, you know, the branded company materials, look at what this company is doing. So I had a bunch of changes to do internally to get to the point where I was ready to share parts of myself because it just felt so foreign. You know, it had been on lockdown for so many years. Mm -hmm. And now as a business owner, of course, you have to tell your story, especially when your business is storytelling or no one's going to take you seriously. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I want to give a quick example of practicing what I preach in this vein and some of the, um, well, I'll just give a, a quick example. So previously would never have posted this, but around the holidays this year, I shared um, a brief story about my sister. And then I shared most, the focus was here are some of the things my colleagues did that were so meaningful and memorable after she passed the things that people did. And my TLDR was, if you know someone who loses someone, reach out and say something, Mm -hmm. basically don't. Don't let the fear of saying the wrong thing keep you from saying something because it's very meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. And just this week, I had someone send me a message that said, Katie, I remembered your post from before the holidays. My friend just lost her son and I was hesitant to say something, Mm -hmm. but because of what you said, I reached out to her. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And it was such a meaningful moment. And it made me think back to you know, years ago, I never would have posted that because I would have been afraid. Not that I was going to say anything offensive or bad, but just that level of authenticity felt unattainable. Yeah. So it's not like I'm sharing, you know, live streaming my whole life, but I am willing to share a lot more of it. Yeah. And my brand is based on not surprisingly authenticity, (laughs) purpose, a little bit of fun, And it's really infused across all of those touch points. It's on my websites, it's on my profiles, it's in every conversation I have like this one where I try to live this practice of bringing my whole self because I'm asking people to entrust me with their very, you know, personal private stories. Yeah. So they have to be able to trust me and see me being authentic and vulnerable. Uh, I do want to add one other thought here. Yeah. So I've been out having conversations with professionals Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of them are going through that struggle I described where they Mm want to be more of themselves online. They don't know how to start. It feels weird, especially if they're working in a corporation, but I'm starting to see this mindset shift within people where professionals, especially people who are successful, kind of see the writing on the wall where they're saying, Hey, it's probably in my best interest. If I'm known for something outside of my corporate identity or outside of my job identity, because we all know layoffs have been happening. Yeah. It's really helpful if you have a group of people who know you for whatever thing you're best at. Yeah. Ready to go that you can tap into if say something happens with your primary employment. So I expect we'll see more of this. People wanting to have, you know, their thing that they do, but then also have something that feels very authentic online that they're, you know, pursuing, talking about being part of in a different way. That's maybe more multifaceted than what used to be the norm for people who are in corporate jobs. So I'm excited to see that happen. I think it will be really great. Yeah. I love that. And you bring up a, you know, a good point, um, especially for people who come from a more um, conservative corporate environment. Um, because, I mean, there are definitely even still some businesses. I've had some candidates who are like, I work mostly in like banking or investment banking, where it's like everything I have has to be approved on social media for security and compliance and all that kind of stuff. And so when you are like just starting to come out of that and be like, you know, where do I even start? Like, it can be really daunting. Mm-hmm. Um, It can also be really daunting if you're like not a writer. (laughs) Yeah, I have one one, um, employee of mine who, you know, we have to write sort of like quick summaries about candidates when we're presenting them. And she's like, this is such a struggle for me. I am not a writer, right? Like for some people like me, I can just writing is something I love to do, knock it out in like two seconds. 
some people's brains just don't work that way. And that that's totally fine because they have a different skill set and set of strengths. Um, some people aren't aesthetically creative, right? Like, how do I make this look pretty? Um, it's I see it pretty common in the EA role of like, there are people who are like really good at like numbers and budgets and spreadsheets but they're like, do not give me a deck to edit. Like, I'm not going to be able to make it pretty. But then, but then you have the opposite case where they're like, I'll do decks all day. And they're like, but don't give me a spreadsheet. Right. And so, and so it can be really daunting for people, which is why, like, I'm so excited that you and I got connected because you're a creative like me and also an amazing storyteller. And so, you know, for people who are like, don't know where to start and like probably watching this webinar and like, how do I get this going? Because I want to create a consistent theme, a create a consistent message, make myself have a better external presence. We actually developed a package that's kind of part coaching, part training, part creative um, to help everybody make that easy. So, um, so I'll kind of share this a little bit, which I think is great because it's specifically tailored for our EA chief of staff community. You and I built it. I was formerly an EA. You've been a chief of staff. Um, so we understand sort of like the struggle that people go through with identity. And um, this like package that we did is the nicest thing is, is like all you, have, all you have to do is answer five questions and you do it once a week over the course of five weeks and we do the rest. So Katie, do you want to walk through what that looks like a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. And big plus one on not starting with a blank sheet of paper, because that, whether it's an essay for school or something like this, that's the worst feeling is when you pull yeah. up a blank document and you're, you feel like you're starting from zero. So um, we know not everybody has days and weeks to go off and do leadership programs or sit in the desert or do the things that Meg <laughs> <and I> described <laughs> to find our stories. So we wanted to make it easier for you. Mm -hmm. So what the package includes is there's a kickoff video that goes a little bit deeper um, into some of the things we talked about today and really laser focused on just why it is so important to have an updated brand, especially on LinkedIn from a recruiter's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and you get a sneak peek to the recruiter lens from Megan. Uh, it's the, the LinkedIn recruiter. <laughs> uh, which I, I learned plenty of things just making the video with you. So there's lots of good nuggets in there. Yeah. Then we do, like she said, a five-week guided reflection. So this is, you get one question per week in your email, you respond, whatever format works for you, easy peasy, forget about it until the next week. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of the five weeks, we take all of the responses and we draft your story. So we find the connections, we do the synthesis, and we draft a professionally written bio, which is perfect for LinkedIn or your resume or you know, your website if you have a website. Mm -hmm. And we'll include some recommended keywords as well because you'll learn why those are so important in the video. Yeah. Um, we also produce some custom banner images. Those are the billboards that sit behind your picture on LinkedIn based on your preferences for, um, design and colors, and it'll look really nice behind your picture. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll give you a personal branding checklist. So you'll have, you know, these products for LinkedIn, but you also want to keep an eye on your brand across the internet because you aren't just in that one place. Mm -hmm. So it give you some tips for how to do that well. And if you really want to polish your answer to that dreaded question, so tell me about yourself. Yeah. Um, you can choose to add on a live coaching session that kind of brings it all together and really polishes that answer for you. Yeah, thank you, Katie. And we were we're so excited to be able to do this because, again, like it's it's kind of like low, like like there's not a whole lot you have to do, right? Like we want to make it as easy as possible and as accessible as possible, and you know, make it something that just about anybody can do. If you have a computer, which if you're on this webinar right now or watching this, you probably do, right? Like or a phone, um, you know, it makes it really accessible. So, you know, we're gonna, of course, as we always do, post this online, share a send a follow-up email for people with the webinar link, but then also you can contact us at TAC. And if you're interested, we can get you set up for it. So there's gonna be lots of ways in which you can do it. Um, 
anything you want to add to that, Katie, before we wrap up? I know we have five minutes. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A. But any other thoughts around like this package and why it's important? Um, I'll, I'll end by just saying a big thank you for spending the time on this topic. I know um, it, it's a tough one to kind of get started on, but I encourage everyone to really think about how you can bring your authentic self to your professional brand. Uh, like I said, I had a lot of barriers and work that I did to overcome this, but I'm so glad that I did it. It leads to those moments of connection, that story I shared about being able to help someone and just a lot of connection and congruence for me. So um, it is worth the work to get there. Love it. I totally agree. Well, it doesn't look like we have any Q&A, so I'll go ahead and let everybody have five minutes back in their day. But thank you so much, Katie, for joining today. Um, it was great to spend this time with you and also just get to work with you on this because you've been such a delight and uh, excited to continue working with you on this moving forward. Thank you so much. Have a great day.